Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Revlog. Andy here. Today, Subaru unveiled their new 2022 Subaru BRZ. Now, some of the bigger YouTube channels were invited to check out the car in person. Obviously, we're not at that point yet, but if you hit enough of those like buttons down there and subscribe to support us, we will eventually get there. So if you could please show some love, that would be greatly appreciated. As expected from some of my videos, it did definitely add more power and we gained some weight. The first gen weighs in at 2798 pounds and a new car weighs in at 2815 which is about a 17 pound increase. And we all know that's how much I'm going to gain during the Thanksgiving holiday. So maybe we can go a little bit easy on Subaru. Um, although I don't want it to kind of become a pattern for manufacturers to be okay with weight increases. There's also a small caveat there because the limited edition with a lot of options weighs in at 2835 which is technically actually a 37 pound increase. Still probably the size of my burrito that I get at Chipotle. So we did gain some power, uh, the horsepower being rated at 228 horsepower now at 7,000 RPMs and 184 pound-feet of torque at 3,700 RPMs. It's an increase of 23 horsepower and 28 pound-feet of torque from the previous generation. Now, I was really afraid when I heard the news that Subaru basically dropped the Subaru Ascent SUV 7-seater uh, the engine in that car and took the turbos off and dumped it in the, the BRZ. Um, I thought they took kind of the Nissan route when they basically shared the VQ engine all across different platforms. Um, and, you know, essentially making uh, a car that doesn't really feel like a sports car because of a generic engine. But at least on the specs, it seems like the bore is larger than the stroke. Um, so that alone, you know, is a pretty good recipe for a, a good sports car engine, meaning you have a larger bore and a shorter stroke giving you the faster revving feel. Uh, no, and normally those kind of engines sound really good too, so uh, I'm looking forward to driving that in person. And apparently the new engine is actually even mounted lower, achieving a, a better center of gravity. Um, we'll have to figure out if they just lower the ride height or something to cheat this number, uh, but this is what they claim. The ride height also went from 52 inches to 51.6, which is a reduction of 0.4 inches. Um, again, it may go back to just lowering the, the springs to achieve that number, uh, but we'll have to see uh, how that plans out. Also, there's a little bit of confusion on wheelbase number. So um, on the Subaru press release, it says the new car is 101.4 inches long, and the old car comes in at 101.2. So, you know, I know I'm uh, not very good at math, but to me that's point two inches of a difference but the super press release actually says 0 0.02 inches of difference which it really isn't you know that huge of a difference uh, something in the alignment like caster could probably change that um, I highly doubt that the new chassis uh, you know had some room to change wheelbase um, so yeah my guess is something in the alignment factory alignment changed uh, but the number says 0 0.02 additional uh, wheelbase not 0.2 so I, I don't know what to believe to be honest now using some chassis technology they learned from the Subaru Global Platform, apparently they were able to increase the front lateral stiffness by 60%. I would say with a very minimal weight gain of 17 pounds, that's a pretty stout number. So they must be using a higher strength steel in order to achieve this kind of number. And of course the biggest news is that the design changed quite a bit. What do you guys think? Uh, I think in general the car looks a little bit more mature. Uh, you know, all the soft curves being added in there, I think, uh, uh, will attract uh, a more mature, grown-up crowd, in my opinion. Um, in some angles, I think, because of the wider fenders and more, you know, soft curvature. Uh, it is a small car, so it kind of looks a little goofy. Uh, but in general, I think, especially the front end, uh, I mentioned this before uh, in other videos, but uh, I think yeah, I see a little bit of Porsche and like that more rounded fender curves. Um, the rear end with the ducktail, you know, usually I'm a big fan of ducktail designs in general, uh, but I don't know how I feel about the rear end. I like that the, uh, the fog lamps in the back, it's not just the Toyota T anymore, like the older car. Um, I think the more squared off fog lamp reminds me of a Subaru design, so that's really cool. I, the tail lamps themselves, although again, I think it's more of a mature design, um, it just reminds me of the NSX in a really, really odd way for some reason. Um, yeah, so I, 
and maybe the new STI uh, could look like that. I know some of the early renderings uh, suggested something that looks similar. Um, <laughs> but I'm not in love with the rear end. Also, I don't really like the um, the way they cut off. Now it's like a really straight uh, greenhouse. Uh, the bottom portion of it anyhow uh, where the smaller window uh, usually on the on the older car here you can see that the bottom of the smaller window actually curls up towards the C pillar but now they kind of made it straight um, so I just if it feels like in general they wanted to clean up the car and make it look more classier and a little bit simpler it's also really interesting to me that they've added in the Michelin PS4S as the optional tire on the limited version with the 18 inch wheels. Uh, the width still stays the same at the scant 215 millimeters. Um, so I'm sure with the additional horsepower, it's, you know, it's not very difficult to get the car to slide, I, I would bet. Um, but this is such an inherent change in the direction of the car, you know, the overall platform. Um, the one of the biggest things that tata -san really mentioned is they wanted to do stuff that the only manufacturers can do and not something that um, the end consumer can easily tune. And tires and wheel package is something that's easily done, yeah? So I find it uh, odd that uh, they've added this tire package. Maybe the, the smaller addition of power and torque uh, they felt the need, but I, but I highly doubt that. I think they're just out to get uh, higher slalom numbers and skip pad, you know, G forces and stuff like that. You know, what makes the magazine spec readers happy? Um, so, I mean, in a way, I, I find this tire package really uh, interesting. And a lot of my friends that are, you know, doing time attacks at the track uh, claim that the Michelin PS4S isn't exactly the most grippy tire, to be honest, uh, especially compared to the likes of the other 200 uh, Troy's wear tires like the RS4 um, and maybe the Nexons. So yeah, I just, I just find this direction really strange. Another thing that I find also extremely strange is that Tadasan is nowhere to be seen. I mean, this is basically his baby, yeah? Um, and he, he created this whole revolution of you know, bringing back the sports cars into the Toyota brand, uh, along with obviously getting the permission from the CEO, Akio Toyota-san. Um, but yeah, I just find that really aw awkward that he, he's not anywhere. Maybe you know, due to COVID restrictions, he's not allowed to travel outside of Japan. Um, so, you know, I, I would have to keep a keen eye on what the Japanese media is uh, is doing in terms of promoting this car with Tadasan. Uh, I really want to get his inputs and some of the uh, the reasonings on, uh, you know, things like the tire choices and the newly developed engine. I think uh, it's a huge missed opportunity, in my opinion, that Toyota didn't include him in some of these PRs. And of course, there's some big changes in the interior as well. Um, I'm a I'm a little bit sad that they made the interior more straight and mainstream. Um, I really like those two dome design that they uh, had in the original car. Uh, to me, it was actually a nod back to the original Toyota 2000 GT uh, in a more modern way. So I, I really like that design, but uh, I guess to mainstream buyers, they want to see a little bit more clean cut uh, interior layout. Um, so in, in a way, it is, it, it's very purposeful. So. Uh, um, you know, it's it'll appeal to more buyers, I think. But I personally like the real uh, connection to the Toyota 2000 GT. Uh, but I can understand that it's a little bit more controversial for a lot of people. Um, and then there's another touch that I don't really like, and it's the fact that they got rid of the analog center gauge. Um, I, I totally get that the the full LCD you know whatever TFT screens uh, is the mainstream thing to do, but um, I think it actually makes the car look extremely old really fast. Screen technologies you know develop really fast, and within a few years, if you have a car with an old screen tech, it's one of those first things that you see and feel outdated. It's actually one of the reasons why I think the Bugatti Veyron interior doesn't show its age too much because there's not too many screens. You know, they kept a lot of the physical forms. But having said that, the screen gauge cluster does give you the flexibility to give you different modes. Um, so I do welcome the track mode setting where it's more of a linear bar. Um, I think Ford Mustang uh, has already started that trend. Uh, and you, you also see it on the higher end sporty cars like the, the Corvettes. Um, 
But uh, yeah, I think that's a pretty cool touch and obviously adds to the driving experience. Um, Subaru also complicated things a bit uh, by adding in the uh, Subaru EyeSight. Um, I don't know how many people would appreciate added safety features. <laughs> uh, maybe it makes it easier to convince your uh, significant other to buy a sporty car because it's safer. Um, I would have rather probably taken the price reduction, but I'm sure it's one of those uh, mandatory things that the manufacturers would like to push. I just hope that it doesn't cause any weird calibration issues when it comes to dropping the traction control completely. I still remember doing the weird pedal dents move, the pump the brake three times and then pull the e-brake three times and then back and forth, back and forth to really lose the traction control on the car. Uh, I'm, I'm now driving an S1000 where I just go to the track and just drive it. <laughs> so uh, now that I think about it, it's kind of a weird move before you uh, unleash the car. <laughs> um, it's also really cool though that we uh, retain a manual option. Um, I think that's, you know, in the automotive world right now, there's less than 1% of us driving manuals uh, here in the US. So the more choices, the better. I do think one part of suspension they could have maybe advanced was if they included uh, adaptive suspension, I think that would have been really cool. Um, if they, you know, they're pushing this car as something that you can drive on a daily basis and go to the track with four tires and tools uh, loaded up in the car. Um, but I think it would have been really cool to have the damping curve uh, that suits that lifestyle, you know, where you could drive it on a softer setting on a daily basis and then you can really turn it up for the track. So there you go, that's my initial impression of the new 2022 Subaru BRZ. What do you all think? Do you like the new design? Would you consider this car in comparison to some of the domestic offerings and also its bigger brother, the base Supra? I'd love to get to a point where I could, you know, drive all these press release cars and give you guys more information in depth. But until then, let's go ahead and continue the conversation in the comments down below.